This is the second video in the two video series on instructor physics theory exam knowledge. These two videos are focusing on the uh, knowledge you need to have for the physics theory exam uh, in the Paddy Instructor course and for the Paddy Instructor exam that don't involve lots of complicated calculations. I have got a bunch of other videos uh, that are very important for you to watch and understand to pass the physics exam that deal with complicated uh, calculation questions uh, and they're organized just using example questions and showing how to find the solutions to them. All of these videos can be found on my website goprocaribbean.com in the dive theory section and they're all laid out in a very easy to understand manner taking your knowledge from from the base level up to what it needs to be at to become an instructor in this video uh, video 2 what I'm going to be looking at is uh, a few things uh, a lot of them to do with with pressure questions uh, and partial pressure so we're going to start by looking at partial pressure in general we are then going to look at contaminated tanks, open liquid filled containers, gas containers, and altitude. Partial pressure is something that uh, there are going to be a few questions on. In my calculations videos that are also on the website, I've got how you can calculate partial pressure. Uh, basically, it's uh, important to understand that the partial pressure of a, uh, a gas, an individual gas such as oxygen or nitrogen, uh, is the part of the total pressure exerted by the mixture of gases. So if you think about air, as far as, as we're concerned, as far as Paddy's concerned, air only contains two different gases. It contains oxygen and it contains nitrogen. Given that nitrogen is 79% of that gas and oxygen represents 21% of air, then at sea level, when you're under one atmosphere of pressure, the total pressure of this gas is one atmosphere. If 21% of it is oxygen, uh, convert 21% into a decimal, 0 0.21, 0 0.21 atmospheres is the part of the total pressure being exerted by the oxygen in air. 79% nitrogen, convert that to a decimal, 0 0.79. 0 0.79 atmospheres is the part of the total pressure being exerted by nitrogen in air at sea level. The partial pressure of oxygen in air at 30 meters is well firstly we need to know the total pressure at 30 meters which would be four atmospheres the percentage of oxygen in air is 21 percent so 4 times 0 0.21 is 0 0.84 so the part of the total pressure four atmospheres that is represented by oxygen is 0 0.84 atmospheres the rest of that total pressure we know that the pressure is four atmospheres the balance would be nitrogen uh, 3.16 atmospheres of that total pressure would be being exerted by nitrogen now you understand partial pressure we can look at contaminated tanks uh, why did i put contaminated tanks after partial pressure well it's because uh, they're very very closely related thing the effect of a gas uh, on you a diver is going to be based on the partial pressure of that gas if the gas in question is a contaminant uh, a gas that we don't want to be breathing because it will have uh, very negative effects on us uh, then obviously we're very concerned about what the effect this contaminant will have on us and that is all going to be based on the partial pressure of that contaminant and the partial pressure, as you now know, will increase the deeper you go. Basically, the questions in the PADI exam will be uh, stating that a tank has been contaminated with a certain percentage of, of either carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. It really doesn't matter what the gas is. Uh, the point is uh, the 
the effect it's going to have on you or and this is the key thing you need to realize is the percentage of it basically the question is very often a trick question you need to read very carefully whether the question is asking you what the effect of that gas will be on you at a given depth because the effect of a contaminated tank increases with depth but the question may talk about a tank that's got a certain percentage of carbon monoxide let's say it's got one percent carbon monoxide in it and you're descending to a depth of 40 meters uh, and then it's just going to ask you what is the percentage of carbon monoxide at this depth the percentage never changes you have the same percentage of contaminant uh, at depth as you did at the surface uh, when you descended with that tank that had 1% carbon monoxide down to 40 meters were you or was someone adding carbon monoxide to your tank as you descended no they weren't uh, you've still got 1% carbon monoxide in your tank at whatever depth you go to what's going to change is the effect that carbon monoxide has on you Using an example here, we have a tank that has been contaminated with 2% carbon monoxide and we are descending to a depth of 20 meters. What is the percentage of carbon monoxide at 20 meters? It's still 2%. The percentage never changes. So if the question asks you for the percentage, you've just got to see what the percentage is in the question. And that is your answer. There is no need to do any math at all. No need to get a calculator out. However, if the question asks you, what is the effect of the carbon monoxide at a depth of 20 meters compared to the surface? Well, then you're going to have to get out your calculator and you're going to have to note down that the tank has 2% carbon monoxide in it. And then you need to look at the depth and work out what the pressure at that depth is at 20 meters. We're under three atmospheres. If you uh, didn't know how to do that, well, I've got a video that can show you how to do that. Uh, it's in physics part one on my website, www.goprocaribbean.com slash dive theory is where you will find all these videos. And we know that at 20 meters, we have three atmospheres of pressure. So what we have is we've got 2% carbon monoxide at three atmospheres of pressure times three equals 6% carbon monoxide. So it is having the effect of breathing 6% carbon monoxide at the surface, even though the percentage of carbon monoxide is only 2%. And if you think now back to partial pressure questions that we've just looked at, that actually makes perfect sense. What we've just seen there is that the partial pressure of carbon monoxide has increased from 0 0.02 atmospheres up to 0 0.06 atmospheres. It's increased from 2% to 6%. At least the effect has. The percentage always remains the same. Read the question. Is it asking you for the percentage? Is it asking you for the effect? Open liquid filled containers. Well, you're an open liquid filled container. Uh, basically, Paddy do like to ask quite a few questions where they talk about an open liquid filled container being placed under pressure or having the pressure released on it being put in a hyperbaric chamber um, and really if you just replace the words open liquid filled container with diver uh, it actually makes the questions quite a lot more easy to understand here's what you need to know liquid absorbs the gases that they are exposed to uh, and they absorb them to a pressure equal to the pressure that they are under. I've got a glass of water sitting on my desk uh, right next to me right now. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, many of you viewers do as well. So if you look at that glass of water uh, and uh, assuming you're sitting at sea level, um, it has air dissolved in it. And because you're at sea level and you're under a pressure of one atmosphere, there is actually one atmosphere of air dissolved in the glass of water sitting on my desk right now. And if you're at sea level and you've got one on your desk, there's one atmosphere of air dissolved in your glass of water too. So, 0 0.21 atmospheres 
uh, of that dissolved gas in your glass of water is oxygen because air is 21% oxygen and 0 0.79 atmospheres uh, of the dissolved gas uh, in your water is nitrogen. What would happen if I then took a glass of water and put it in a hyperbaric chamber or pressure pot, they're basically the same thing, and increased the pressure that that glass of water was under to five atmospheres? Slowly, air would dissolve into the water until it had five atmospheres of air dissolved into it. If I then released the pressure that this gas was under by taking my pressure pot or, or, or reducing the pressure in my hyperbaric chamber back down to one atmosphere, the gas that had dissolved into that glass of water would start coming out of solution. Would bubbles form in that glass? Well, quite possibly. It actually would depend how quickly you reduce the pressure. If you reduce the pressure from five atmospheres to one atmosphere over a period of 24 hours, you would be very unlikely to see any gas bubbles forming in that glass of water. But if you reduced it very, very rapidly, uh, you would very likely uh, see gas bubbles uh, in that water as the water, as the gas rapidly came out of solution. It would actually form bubbles. And there's an everyday example that you can think of where you see exactly that and that is any time you uh, open a bottle of, of coca-cola sprite whatever you like to drink um, what you're actually doing when you open that bottle is you are reducing the pressure the gas is under and the gas that is dissolved into that liquid probably carbon dioxide is going to come out of solution and it's going to come out of solution fairly quickly. You open that cap and you reduce the pressure very, very quickly. So the gas is going to come out of solution very, very quickly. And you're going to end up with uh, bubbles forming. So the key thing to put in your notes, if you increase the pressure in contact with an open liquid filled container, the pressure of the gas dissolved within it will increase. If you decrease the pressure in contact with an open liquid filled container, the pressure of the gas dissolved within it will decrease. Uh, another good uh, example of this would be a soda stream. What we can see there is we've got an open liquid filled container and we are going to increase the pressure it is under by sealing it and then pumping carbon dioxide into the bottle. That addition of gas to that bottle, that sealed bottle, will increase the pressure within that bottle. And the CO2 will go into solution in the liquid. Gas containers. I just want to look at two different types of gas containers. A scuba tank and a balloon. Let's make sure that we understand how gas actually exerts pressure. And it is all to do with the molecules of gas hitting the walls of the container. So we have two containers, container A and container B. As you look at these two containers, I want you to imagine that the, the little balls uh, that you see bouncing around are molecules of gas. What do you notice about the difference between the molecules of gas in container A and container B? Well, in container B, they're clearly moving faster. Okay, It appears that it's actually the same number of molecules in both container A and container B, but the molecules in container B are moving faster. So if we think about the impacts that those molecules are having on the wall of the container, they are impacting with the walls of the container more frequently and at a greater speed in container B than they are in container A. 
So those more frequent impacts and the higher velocity of the impacts would mean that the pressure in container B is higher than the pressure in container A. What would explain why the molecules are moving faster in container B than in container A? It must be that the temperature of container B is greater than the temperature in container A. So that is a little bit about how gas exerts pressure. Let's think about our two gas containers that you might be asked questions about in the Pali exam. A scuba tank is rigid. Um, when you, uh, it can't change size, obviously. Um, it's designed that way so it can withstand uh, holding a, a high degree of pressure. So if you increase the number of air molecules inside it, or if you increase the temperature of the air molecules, what is going to happen? The pressure is going to increase. It can't get bigger, but something's got to change. So what changes is the pressure? And then really the opposite of that is a balloon. A balloon is elastic, it's flexible. If you increase the number of air molecules inside it by blowing into it, you will know that that balloon is going to get bigger. If you increase the temperature the balloon is under, it's going to get bigger. Why? Because the air molecules that are in it are colliding with the walls of the balloon at a higher velocity and more often, and that is increasing the pressure. Um, but rather than actually allow the pressure in the balloon to increase, because it's elastic, it gives and it just gets bigger. Uh, and a great example of this is uh, if you are living somewhere that's very, very hot uh, and you're maybe decorating for a child's party, if you go and blow the balloons uh, right up to the extent of, of their, their ability uh, and then place them outside, uh, hang them in the direct sunlight, uh, you will notice as the afternoon progresses the balloons all popping because uh, they can no longer take the pressure they're under because the air molecules have heated up and they uh, they can't take that uh, increased expansion. So uh, word to the wise, if you are organizing a child's birthday party in a very hot, sunny location, when you uh, blow up the balloons, if it's going to be a while before the children actually arrive, uh, don't blow them all the way up. Blow them about 75%, and by the time they arrive and they've heated up, you'll find that they are, are looking great rather than a bunch of burst balloons hanging on a post. The final topic in this video is going to be altitude. Now, altitude is uh, something that's covered in a lot of the different dive theory sections. Uh, you could get questions on altitude diving in the skills and the environment exam. Uh, it's possible you could get questions about altitude in the physiology exam as well. Um, what I'm trying to look at here is how the altitude topic may be addressed or what questions might be asked about altitude in the physics exam. The pressure at altitude is less than it is at sea level. At an altitude of 10,000 feet, 3,000 meters, the pressure is only 0 0.7 atmospheres approximately. That's compared with one atmosphere at sea level. So put that another way, there is a 0 0.3 atmospheres difference between the gas pressure in your body and the gas pressure surrounding you when you ascend to an altitude of 10,000 feet from sea level. This means uh, that when you ascend to altitude from sea level, you will actually start to release gas uh, from solution in your body. Uh, remember, we are just like those open liquid filled containers we discussed earlier in this video. It's almost the same as when you surface from a dive. Uh, when you ascend to altitude, you're reducing the pressure you're under. When you ascend from a dive, you're reducing the pressure you're under. So we are almost surfacing to altitude, and we start to off-gas once we reach altitude, and uh, until we once again uh, reach equilibrium. This is, of course, the reason for the flying after diving rules, uh, and these rules should also be considered when driving to altitude. Many people uh, know the flying after diving rules and abide by them, but it's quite common for people to, to fail to think about the fact that if they drive to altitude after a dive, they're putting themselves in a very similar situation to uh, flying after a dive.
what I want to do now is use some, some fairly random numbers uh, to illustrate what is happening. The key point to, to focus in on is the differences in these numbers, and they're going to illustrate what we're actually talking about. When you ascend to an altitude of 10,000 feet from sea level, the, re the pressure you're under reduces from 1 atmosphere to 0 0.7 atmospheres. We've already looked at that. Therefore, Let's now look and focus on nitrogen because we know that's what causes DCS. The partial pressure of the nitrogen in your body will over time reduce from 0 0.79 atmospheres, which is the partial pressure of nitrogen in your body at sea level, to 0 0.55 atmospheres, which would be the partial pressure of nitrogen at an altitude of 10,000 feet where the ambient pressure is 0 0.7 atmospheres. So that basically means when you first go to altitude from sea level, when you first go to 10,000 feet, the difference between the pressure of the nitrogen dissolved in your body and the pressure of the partial pressure of the nitrogen surrounding you, the nitrogen you're breathing into your lungs, would be a 0 0.24 atmospheres difference. Now, this wouldn't be a big enough uh, nitrogen pressure difference to cause DCS. If you had just done a dive before ascending to altitude, and let's say, for the purpose of this example, after that dive you had a nitrogen partial pressure of 1.05 atmospheres. Let's now think about how that is going to change things. So now, at sea level, when you actually surfaced from that dive at sea level, the difference between your tissue's nitrogen partial pressure and the surrounding nitrogen partial pressure would be 0 0.26 atmospheres. Your tissue partial pressure of 1.05 atmospheres, the partial pressure of the nitrogen surrounding you and in your lungs would be 0 0.79 atmospheres. The difference between those is 0 0.26 atmospheres. Again, that would assumably be low enough to be free from DCS. But now let's imagine we immediately ascend to 10,000 feet. The difference between your tissues nitrogen partial pressure and the surrounding nitrogen partial pressure would now be your tissues nitrogen partial pressure of 1.05 minus the surrounding nitrogen partial pressure of 0 0.55, meaning that the difference is now 0 0.5 atmospheres. So this much greater difference in your nitrogen uh, partial pressure loading of your tissues and the nitrogen partial pressure surrounding you has created a much higher nitrogen partial pressure gradient or, or, or proportional difference in nitrogen partial pressure between your body and surrounding. Uh, it's doubled, in fact, or almost doubled. That difference might be big enough to cause DCS. So to kind of summarize it, maybe uh, some good points to have as, as notes. The lowered partial pressure at altitude can increase the difference between the nitrogen partial pressure in your body or in your tissues and the surrounding nitrogen partial pressure. In the example we just looked at, an increase from 0 0.26 atmospheres at sea level to 0 0.5 atmospheres at 10,000 feet. And we know that DCS is caused when the pressure gradient between the nitrogen in our bodies and the surrounding pressure becomes too great. And we can see from that worked example using numbers that ascending to altitude after a dive could easily double that gradient. And that increased gradient might be the difference between getting DCS and not getting DCS. So in video one, briefly, we looked at refraction, visual reversal, and the properties of water. What we've just looked at in video two here was partial pressure, contaminated tanks, open liquid-filled containers, gas containers, and altitude.
if you haven't uh, yet looked at all my calculations questions using worked examples, uh, now would be a great time to start looking at them. If you've got a dive master exam coming up or if you are planning on attending uh, an IDC or IE in the near future. If you haven't yet planned your IDC or IE, uh, I do IDCs every month on the beautiful sunny island of Roatan. Uh, click on the link at the end of this video to get in touch with me and visit our website and I will be more than happy to help you uh, achieve your dream. So if these videos are helping you, uh, please uh, click the like button, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and what would be even better would be to blog or, or post in forums about these videos, how much they've helped you, and make sure you link people, not to my YouTube channel, but to my website, www.goprocaribbean.com. Uh, help others uh, find this material uh, and, and make their journey to becoming a Paddy Pro easier and, and more painless. And obviously by doing that, you're also helping me a little bit.